Hello, and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. In these videocasts, we go over some of the latest and most interesting studies that have been done on COVID research from a data science and informatics perspective. This is for fans of data science and informatics everywhere. If you're not an expert, don't worry, there's plenty to enjoy here. You wanna create a snapshot of what's going on and not do an exhaustive search of everything that's happening. A lot of research is coming out. We're just highlighting things that I think are especially interesting. This week's topics include systematic evaluation of serological tests, so we avoid those types of um, biases and errors that we saw last week. Large single cell sequencing and its debut in COVID research. Modeling what's gonna happen in the years to come after this first wave of the pandemic. And I'm gonna do a little special feature on some very interesting data-driven journalism. All right, now, systematic evaluation of serological tests. This study published titled Test Performance Evaluation of SARS-CoV-2 Serological Assay by Whitman et al. It's a preprint and it was put online April 24th, 2020. Now, the goal here is to systematically compare all the commercially available serological tests and evaluate their performance of those tests. Not to pick one that's the best or say that this company's better than that one, but identify where each test could be useful. So they evaluated the performance of 12 tests by the time of the symptom onset, disease severity, and some other clinical features. They found that performance across the board peaks after 20 days of symptom onset, and that specificity was somewhere between 84 and 100%. The inclusion here is this is a really nice data-driven approach of how to evaluate serological tests. And I think it'll be a really valuable resource for fighting the pandemic. Also, they have a gorgeous website. I'm gonna show you some figures from there. So just to go over just a little bit about what are these serological tests that we have been hearing about? And these are these lateral flow assays. Um, so in these, um, they're actually really quite simple. They're really cool. And they work by um, some simple physics and capillary action. So basically, you have this setup where you have this matrix here in the middle. And you put your sample into this little sample well. This could be blood or extracts or um, other prepared samples. You then load it with some buffer. And then by capillary action, it kind of gets sucked through and lateral flow. So it's going to go across. So it's getting pulled across this matrix. And depending on how big the antibodies are that are attached, it's gonna pull at different rates. And so some things are gonna pull faster than others. So the control actually is gonna pull real fast and the test is actually gonna pull a little slower. And that's why you end up seeing these two lines develop on these tests. They're really tried and true methods. They work a lot. You see them in pregnancy tests, for example. Um, <clears throat> and then, and that's basically how it works. In the end, you'll see, if you see that control, you know that something actually pulled through. If you don't see the control, that means that nothing actually pulled through and you can't trust that test. Okay, now let's talk about what this study found. They systematically went through, evaluated these 12 tests, and they evaluated a lot of different metrics. One of them was specificity. And so this came up so much last week for that Santa Clara study, it would be important to go over here. What we see is um, when you think of specificity, um, this is just taken from the Wikipedia page, which is the best kept secret in data science for these types of things. These pages are really informative, really valuable. I go to them all the time. Um, so specificity is the number of true negatives um, over the number of all the negatives. So it's basically saying how, um, how much of everyone who, who is negative are you predicting to be negative? And so um, you can see here, they have a varying performance and um, there are some tests that seem to perform pretty well across the board and some tests which are a little, perform a little bit worse. Um, but again, as we'll get into a little bit later, there are trade-offs between sensitivity and what's called uh, specificity, this, and what's called sensitivity. And we'll get into that in a second. So here are two, sensitivity and specificity. Here you can see that trend, that severity is increasing over uh, that sensitivity is increasing over time up and maximizes around the 20 day window. And that specificity um, is varies across the different tests. They found that the IgG based test might be slightly better, but mostly these were pretty consistent with each other. 
And of course, that there's this important trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. So which should you use? Well, it depends on the use case. Uh, let's say that you, had, you wanted to conduct population-wide screening. Now, screening usually means you want a really sensitive test. And sensitive means that of all the people who have the disease, you want to, how many of them are you capturing? Let's say we sampled 1,000 people and 100 of those people had the disease, and we captured 99 of them. That's 99% sensitivity. Uh, and But with that could come a lot of false positives. Maybe with those same thou that 1,000 screen, you actually had uh, 200 people test positive. So you, then you had 101 people who were false positives. So sensitive tests are good at capturing everybody who has the disease, but along with that comes some false positives. The specificity is when you want to maybe make treatment decisions. So if you wanted to say, oh, what, prescribe a potentially toxic or dangerous treatment like chemotherapeutics or radiation therapy, you want to be really sure that you are not treating someone who doesn't need that treatment um, because the consequence is really large. So in those cases, you want to tend toward a test that's more specific. So essentially you're asking yourself, is it more important to capture everyone? Or is it more important that I identify when I say somebody is positive, that they are positive? And as I have mentioned before, there's some really beautiful figures that show sensitivity and specificity in a lot of different ways. And I encourage you to go to this website and check that out. SARS-CoV-2 receptor ACE2 is an interferon-stimulated gene in human airway epithelial cells and detected in specific cell subsets across tissues. This is Zeigler et al. Cell, published April 20th, 2020. The goal of this study was to look at the expression and dynamics of cell-specific ACE2 and TMPRSS2 expression. These are two of the genes that the virus uses to get into the cell, ACE2 to attach and TMPRSS2 to and get inside. The method they use was take existing single cell RNA data, sequencing data, and reanalyze them by focusing their analysis on these two specific genes. What they found is that not all cells are created equal in terms of their expression of these two, of these two genes. In fact, some cells express them much more highly than others, and that's true across the board. They looked at different types of lung cells, for example and found that some lung cells express them very highly where some are relatively low. What that means is that some of our cells, depending on what their function is and what exactly they're doing, where they're from, could be more susceptible. It, my conclusion here is that this is quite a clever use of existing data to address a really potent question right now, and understanding these mechanisms of how the virus works exactly will help us fight the virus in the future. I'm going to a little bit of single cell sequencing. So it used to be that we would do sequencing analysis or what's called microarray analysis. We're looking at the activity of genes and we would just take blood because it's really simple to get blood. We donate blood, we get blood all the time. It's pretty quick for most of us. And then you would basically mix all that up and do some measurements. But the problem with that is that the blood is the traffic system. It's how our cells communicate with each other. It's a disposal system too. It's got everything is happening in the blood. So multiple tissues are represented, multiple cell types are represented, and they all get mixed up together and then sequenced. So that means you don't really know where in the body it's coming from. You just get this kind of global view of what's happening. So then what you could do is you could say, okay, well, I'm gonna assay a particular tissue. I'm gonna take a biopsy of the liver or the kidney, and I'm gonna do it that way. And that way, okay, so you take a little bit of the tissue and you crunch that up and you sequence that and you get what's going on in that specific tissue or organ. But they have the same thing. Your tissues are not just made of, of all one type of organ. Your heart has many different complex cell types and each one is doing a different action and is responsible for different activities in the heart. So you wanna know what's the difference between those, those. And you can't really tell that by just doing this. A single cell gets us at that because what we do is we take those cells, you take that same sample, but instead of kind of mixing it all up together, you separate them out capture each one individually, and then you sequence each individual cell to see like what genes are on in that cell right now. And what that gets you is a much more focused picture of what is happening in, into the molecular biology of the cell and how it differs from cell type to cell type. And you get these really beautiful graphs uh, that differentiate different cell types and allow you to see the different actions and responsibilities that these different cells have. It's kind of like how 
spectroscopy advanced after getting better, better lenses or moving to electron microscope. It's basically an a, a increase in our magnification into molecular biology. So this is one of the greatest figures from this uh, study. And so this is a study, they did a lot of different analyses. I can encourage you to check out all the results there, but I picked out a couple. So this one is looking at lung cells. You take that little bit of lung sample, you do this analysis where you separate each individual cell, you sequence each individual cell, and you make these beautiful maps of activity. And so you can see they label different cell types and you're able to do this by looking for different markers of what that cell type is. And what they did, importantly over here, you can see that they mapped where ACE2 and TNPRSS2 are overexpressed compared to other cell types. And you can see that ACE2 is overexpressed in this, these cells right here, and TNPRSS2 is expressed in a little bit more globally in this different cell subtype. And you can see that they map over here to these pneumocytes. So they focus their analysis on there. Um, those cells are the ones that are, might be the most susceptible to infection. They replicated this in two additional models. So they used non-human primate data and they found the exact same thing there. They also did this study in mouse. And one thing that they found that was really interesting and novel was that interferon regulates ACE2 expression. It's a strong regulator. And this is across the board. There's many different types of interferon. And pretty much across the board, it's regulating that ACE2 expression. This could open up really interesting avenues of research. Maybe we need to kind of interfere with interferon. That could be a possible treatment. I looked it up. I don't see any active um, or approved drugs that do that right now that are you know, interferon gamma inhibitors, but um, there, many could be in the works, and there are chemical compounds that are known to do that. So some modeling to decide what our future is going to look like. This is a pretty cool study and it has some interesting dynamics we'll dive into. Projecting the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 through the post-pandemic period. Kistler et al. published in Science on April 14th, 2020. The goal here was to simulate possible different post-pandemic futures. Will we see recurrence and at what rate we'll see recurrence and when will we see those recurrences? They used data from two historical beta coronaviruses to fit some models and then predict out um, based on the seasonality, the immunity, and the cross immunity with other beta coronaviruses that we might have. And um, what they do is they project that there will be wintertime outbreaks and they stress, and there will be stresses on our critical care system, kind of annual or biannual stresses on the clinical care, on the critical care system. Um, and that recurrent outbreaks are likely um, depending on the dynamics of transmission and immunity. So it's some pretty cool modeling, really data-driven. I like the way they fit the models. And what I take away is that this year's outbreak will probably won't be the last that we hear about SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately. So this is, I'm just gonna show you how they fit the models. Um, so they took data on existing beta coronavirus. This is US data that they took and they fit these models. And you can see that their theoretical fit in the simulated line is close to the actual fit. That's what we like to see. We think a model is well calibrated when you fit them like that. And that's true across both of these. Um, and, and this is kind of the punchline here. They had many figures and there's a little bit more detail you can dive into. But punchline here is that um, if immunity lasts about a year, then we can expect to see recurrence of SARS-CoV-2 annually, almost like the flu. But if immunity lasts a little bit longer than that, approximately two years, then we might see this more biannual trend of recurrence. If immunity lasts forever, then this will be it. Once we get over this, we'll never see it again. Um, and then if you play with the dynamics a little bit, it's possible we'll see after this big outbreak, we'll see small ones occur as late as 2024. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that. A special feature on some really cool data-driven journalism. This is global coronavirus death toll could be 60% higher than reported. Byrne Murdoch, Financial Times, April 26, 2020. So the goal of this study, and I'm going to evaluate as if it is a study, is to estimate the death toll from SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The method was to use public data on deaths from countries hit by outbreaks and compare those numbers to historical averages. Basically, if there are more deaths this year than last year, and the only big difference between this year and last year is coronavirus, then maybe those can be attributed, but not just last year, but historically average. 
And the result is that deaths are much higher this year than historical averages, up to 60% in some cases, and that many of these deaths are likely due to the virus directly or, or indirectly. And I think it's a pretty interesting and solid piece of data-driven journalism and visual storytelling. The piece is really short, it's quick read, and it has some beautiful figures. Um, they're dire, but beautiful. Okay, so the death rates, this is looking, and this is basically the analysis in one figure. So this is looking at how many more deaths are reported this year in these countries versus historical averages. And what I like is that they plot the average, of course, but as we all know, it's really important that we look at the variance or we look at the errors on those averages. And they plot the, all the historical data on top of each other so you can get a sense of that variance. I think the most striking and the most important thing is that many of these curves are way, way beyond that variance, meaning they're very unlikely to occur in a normal year without coronavirus. Now you can see Denmark is well within that number. Um, and so maybe that means they're more they're better controlling, or maybe it means that this year's just not that much different than other years for whatever reason in Denmark. That would need to be followed up in an investigation. But for the most part, you see these very striking deviations from what you'd expect at this time of year. And that's true. They did this analysis at the country level, and they did this analysis at the city level. And what that means is that while um, the reported deaths might be a, a portion of these, actually more deaths could probably be attributed to coronavirus, to SARS-CoV-2, um, because either directly they haven't been reported, they did die of the disease, or they do mention the other issue of maybe they're not seeking care, and, um, but we don't know the total impact of that. Either way, it's related directly or indirectly to the outbreak. Uh, just a reminder to check out the um, description on the video for further reading, news articles that we didn't get to cover, shout outs of great articles, and a list of ongoing projects that you can volunteer for and help. Uh, subscribe now and make sure you don't miss anything. And thank you for your time. See you next week.